Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all my blessed beloveds out there in video land. You're watching Living and Thriving with Rusty, and I'm Rusty. And today's Saturday. You guys don't know that, but I know that. And I'm back to back again. Super excited because I just have a plethora of amazing guests on, whether it's the podcast or the YouTube channel, or some new stuff coming on my Patreon. Uh, just building that chest of information and that will be uploaded by the end of summer. It is technically May 29th, 2021. And I am leaving in about less than a week to hit up the White Mountains. And I'm uber excited about that because I get to visit some of my friends up there, go hiking, do some camping, and really enjoying this beautiful world that we live in. Today's guest is Jeff, and Jeff's going to pop on any minute now to let us know who he is, what he does, and what makes him him. He's trying to pop in. Who? Oh, Jeff, there you are. Here I am. How are you, my dear? I'm good. Good to hey, see you. You got the memo. Right Look, matching shirts. You got the memo. Yeah. Fantastic. We have. <laughs> good morning, my dear. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So Dish, what's been going on? Well, um, I just published another book, which is my 12th. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, that's been kind of a big focus uh, other than playing pickleball. You know, they play that down here and I don't really know what it is. It just sounds kind of bizarre. Like, are you throwing pickles at each other? What, what is pickleball? <laughs> I think that would be more fun than what it actually is. <laughs> it, it's uh, sort of like a tennis for old people. Uh, it's like a, a, a slim down tennis court. And instead of rackets, we use um, solid paddles, kind of like ping pong, large ping pong paddles, and a whiffle ball instead of a hard tennis ball. So, okay. yeah. It's, it's supposedly America's um, now most popular sport among older adults. So are you trying to insinuate that I haven't hit that yet? I love you, Jeff. <laughs> well, I, I know I have. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to welcome you when you get there. <laughs> uh, slow that train down, buddy. Slow it down. <laughs> yeah, I wish. All right. So what's the new book's name? Uh, its uh, title is America's Existential Crisis, um, Our Inherited Obligation to Native Nations. Ooh, that is a mouthful and a mindful and a mind fill, maybe. Well, I, I hope so. But it's, um, it actually uh, started um, a number of years ago. Uh, I discovered that I have an ancestor who was uh, first lieutenant in the 7th Cavalry uh, and a troop leader at the Massacre of Wounded Knee. Wow. And he, um, he was actually, uh, well, the, the next day in a so-called mopping up action after uh, the massacre or battle, depending on your perspective, he was wounded, shot in the hip, and he died 17 days later. But he was interviewed by Harper's Weekly, and he dictated a long letter to his brother during those 17 days when he was trying to recover from his wound. So we have a record of his description of what happened at Wounded Knee, and he's actually um, one of uh, what the, the, the military at the time considered its primary sources uh, for uh, what happened, at, at, as the 7th Cavalry called it, the Battle of Wounded Knee. Um, but it became clear um, through other sources and um, interviews with uh, the members of the Sioux tribe that survived that it really wasn't much of a battle and it was more of a massacre. But so I learned about this ancestor because my mother, who was a journalist, wrote a story about him. Um, and then I have another ancestor who was given a beautiful beaded deerskin 
invest by the surviving Potawatomi in northern Indiana, which is where my family settled, um, because he owned a hardware store and the few remaining members of the tribe after the Trail of Death, which was from northern Indiana to Oklahoma, um, they were starving during a very hard winter and, and some of them were his customers. So he gave them credit and allowed them, you know, whatever supplies they needed to survive. And so out of gratitude, they gave him this vest, which I inherited four generations later. And um, I never really, you know, knew all the details of the story of that vest, but uh, I learned them. And so the book starts out with these two parallel stories of the Indian fighter and the Indian friend. And then it opens up into a history of the reservation system. Um, you know, how did the reservation system get started and the, the Indian wars? And it then uh, leads into an argument that the United States of America and all of us owe the Indian nations a tremendous debt. Because if you think about it, 500 years ago, uh, Indians occupied 100% of the real estate, and there were millions of them. And now there's 5 million, which is 2% of the population, and they uh, live on 2% of the land. So uh, 90, a 90% population loss and a 98% uh, real estate loss. And so we have what we have because they were massacre, massacred and put on reservations. That's a lot of um, what the Seminoles are as well here in Florida, you know, it was all of the tribes were pushed and, and kind of cornered to fall off the face of the earth, so to speak, so that the land grabs could happen and take away from the heathens as they were lovingly labeled. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating to see that in a lot of ways we're repeating the same ideology in our current politics. And, and I just kind of scratch my head going, when are we going to learn? Yeah, um, I'm not sure we will, <laughs> but yeah, the, the Seminoles um, in some ways uh, had it a little better than uh, like the, the, the uh, Native American nation that m my book focuses the most on, al although it, it has a broader focus, but it's um, mostly about the Sioux nation, um, whereas the, the Seminoles were able to escape into the swamp, uh, into the Everglades. And, um, you, you know, man, many of them survived uh, the land grabs and retained uh, some of the land that, that they had traditionally owned, whereas um, the Sioux and most of the, the Midwestern and the Western tribes were not only massacred, but the traditional lands that they had roamed and hunted buffalo on was taken away from them, and they were moved to a completely different area. So at least the Seminoles were able to stay in what had been their traditional lands, Florida. Isn't that interesting? Because some of the, what I've read is that the Seminoles are a combination of Blackfoot, Cherokee, Sioux, um, and over centuries, they, they merged, and that's what Seminole is, is kind of the merger of all of the tribes because they were pushed down to Florida. And the, the slaughter ratio down here for the tribes is huge. Um, I'm currently in a county where I can't say an inch of the dirt wasn't a slaughter ground. Yeah, well, it happened all the way across the continent. Yeah. And there was this ideology called Manifest Destiny which the idea was uh, white Europe, Anglo-European people uh, were, it was God's destiny that we, they, our ancestors should occupy this land and conquer 
anything that got in our way, which not only included uh, the Native Americans, but buffalo and many other species that were, you know, were decimated along with the, the Native people. Buffalo are amazing creatures. They're absolutely beautiful. In New Hampshire, there's this huge buffalo farm that I used to visit, and they're just awe-striking, eloquent creatures. Yeah, they they ha they they seem to have this sort of um, uh, docile wisdom, unless they get pissed off. Yeah, I'll pass on that one. But they're beautiful to look at from a distance. Yeah, they are. I, I was out in Yellowstone um, last year, and <laughs> it was you know some people you you wonder about how they manage to make it out of diapers, but you know, seeing bison herd crossing the road and people getting out of their, their cars, which there are a lot of signs saying don't do that, and getting very close to the bison to take photographs or trying to get selfies with bison. And the bison are, you know, very tolerant, but if you get too close to a calf, and I, I saw the guy didn't get hurt, but he got chased and he went from looking like he thought he was, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger to, <laughs> to the cowardly lion as he ran back to his car. Yeah, a little wet britches on that one. It's funny how people don't use common sense. I, I, and I, common sense is not so common as I'm learning. I mean, even here in Florida, we have signs that say, don't molest the gators. Seems like a kind of obvious lesson to learn one I, that you you know not like the the little <laughs> kid who has to touch the fire to <laughs> to figure out it's hot uh you look Great. at a gator it doesn't look like somebody that would like to be your friend yes on any level intimate or not it's just very bizarre humans i find humans delightful i find them just amazing to watch and explore uh, i mean and all aspects, what I do is a sociological experiment, right? But then there are those that surprise you and you just kind of shake your head going, really? <laughs> yeah, how, how, how did they survive not only toddlerhood, but adolescence? I just, wow, they have a lot of angels surrounding them, that's all. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> so Jeff, remind me what state you're in. Are you still in Indiana? Yeah, yeah, still in Indiana. Um, have I, I, I'm, you know, an old friend of Florida because my family has gone down to Florida for generations. And when I was a little kid, um, my grandmother uh, always went to Lake Worth, uh, you know, over by Palm Beach, Miami. Uh, and then in the 70s, my parents discovered Naples and were one of the early condo buyers in Naples and uh, did very well, uh, were foresightful. And so I saw that community go from 25,000 to 250,000. Oh, it's ridiculous now. It's more than that. It's, uh, it's not even livable. Yeah, I know. Because uh, my mom is still there. So I, I go to Naples uh, twice a year, every year to visit her. But uh, the last few years, I've also had to add California to my annual trips because our younger son is in the film industry and he's out there and he and his wife uh, had their first baby. Uh, thank you. Back so in exciting. April. Yeah, so I am a newly minted grandfather. Is it... Um... I'm, I'm a mother hen. I take everybody and, and put them under my, my feathers and, and I try to protect and, and love everybody. That's just my nature. That's how I was born. And my daughter, who's turning 16 in a couple of weeks, she's getting ready to leave the coop and I'm a hot mess already. And it's going to be like two years, right? Yeah. I can't imagine what kind of hot mess I'm going to be when I'm a grandmother. I'm going to bubble wrap that poor thing. <laughs> well, the babies... They are sweet little things. And um, this one had major um, medical issues when he was born. 
my my son describes it as it's within one minute he had the most wonderful delightful experience of his life and the most terrifying because he was snatched away and taken into emergency surgery and they spent six weeks uh in the icu but he got out and after my wife and i were both vaccinated we went out to visit him um when he was uh right at about two months old and he was fine and, and your wife never came back right she just <laughs> well as soon as we were back she started talking about our next trip out which <laughs> i knew that was coming <laughs> yeah so yeah so we'll we'll probably be back out there uh, in the not too distant future yay well congratulations on the baby what's the baby boy's name cameron quinn excellent very royal very regal <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad the name isn't too weird uh, because but my it's not hot potato or anything like that. So you're... no, not, not that. It's, you know, it's not uh, like Elon Musk's uh, uh, a physicist uh, formula or whatever that <laughs> that was that he gave his or Prince's name, which I think nobody ever understood what that was. Yeah, when he went to the symbol. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think people try to recreate themselves in such so many different ways that sometimes their message gets lost. Yeah, I was um, very traditional in naming our kids, which um, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's because they were boy, two boys. Uh, I got uh, priority in giving them names and if they were girls maybe my wife would have demanded that but I gave them both very traditional um, Anglo-American names Andrew Philip and James Joseph and um, and you know it it makes it easy and you know they've never been made fun of because of their names and they've never had you know people wonder what what ethnicity or race they are, which, you know, like it or not, we, we know very well that African Americans are often disadvantaged just because of their names. Um, and I'm sure Native Americans have experienced the uh, same thing and, and Asians too. I watched a beautiful documentary on um, African Americans reasoning behind their uniqueness of the names. And at the time they were, you know, not able to have much of a voice in any aspect of their life, including their hair. And so the only way that they could have some sort of individuality or, or um, claim to who they are as a human on this planet was to have unique names. And so it was really kind of a, a primordial middle finger to the white man. <laughs> you know, because we're not going to be forced into naming our children biblical names. And even to this day in 2021, we have countries, I want to say Switzerland is actually one of them. It might be Finland. It's one of the Nord Nordic countries. Um, you're not allowed to name your child anything outside of what's in their registry. You actually have to go to court if you want to do something unique. And uh, it's interesting how important naming is to people and, and how they hold on to that for various reasons, whether it's individuality or um, recognizing their, their family history. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I find that completely understandable. And um, yeah, the, yeah, I mean, dealing with the legacy that African Americans uh, have to deal with, that uh, Native, Native Americans have to deal with. And, you know, now we're kind of waking up, uh, or at least some people who weren't uh, educated about it before are waking up to uh, the discrimination and uh, difficulties that Asian Americans have had. And, you know, now with this new wave of uh, violent assaults against Asian Americans were, you know, I mean, I, I hope a, at least a positive development will be a, a greater sensitivity to that. Um, 
so, but, uh, you know, it just seems like we go through these cycles um, and we have not evolved out of that primitive us, them, um, you know, if you're not like me, you're my enemy, or I fear you, one or the other. Uh, it, it's, you know, for somebody who's uh, not only educated, but morally decent and has experienced um, the world in terms of other cultures and so forth, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to get that, but I, yeah, I think we... I think You're we hanging took out with a chick named Rusty. You want to talk about discrimination? Third. My, ni my name rhymes with everything. Trust me, I could tell you about third grade trauma. Yeah. Jump roping trauma, because it rhymes with everything. But again, I think the, the power in our ability to adapt, adjust, and to survive is actually to become more educated and compassionate. And there is a real stick in the mud group of people who refuse to step outside of what they think they know. And, uh, and I, and right now we're seeing that, especially with this new Asian hate crime. I mean, come on guys, seriously, don't we have better things to worry about? Yeah. And that somehow, and, and of course we, we know that uh, Trump fanned those flames uh, with, uh, with the Chinese virus and all that, but that, you know, to think, because the first place this virus was discovered was in China, that Chinese Americans, and then not just Chinese Americans, but Japanese Americans, uh, Pacific Islander Americans, that even Native Americans who might look uh, Asian are somehow at fault. I mean, this is such a, <laughs> you know, a bizarre uh, chain of connections to, to blame and hate uh, and act violently towards your fellow citizens. Um, well, and I think it's just a sign of uh, de-evolution or maybe their primordial primitive brains haven't really expanded too much because they're still in that, you're different, so I'm going to, you know, compete against you so that I get the bigger meat at the end of today's buffalo chase. Like, that's all it reads to me is that just part of their brain has not evolved into a, a larger organ. I don't know. <laughs> do you know what I mean? No, yeah, I do know what you mean. And um, uh, a book I wrote back in 2017 um, in, in response to the terribly polarized uh, 2016 campaign and and election of Donald Trump. Um, the, the title of it was Polarized, the Case for Civility in the Time of Trump. Um, uh, you know, I, I interviewed, uh, I think it was 29 people who had voted for Trump and, uh, you know, why, uh, what motivated you. And there was, uh, with particularly the less educated uh, Trump voters is very much a visceral uh, sense of my white culture is is being uh, overrun by immigrants and by black people uh, and I, and there's this kind of as you were saying this kind of primordial fear um, and so that you know, has not only motivated them to vote for somebody who, you know, had many racist dog whistles and, and you know, is clearly sort of a, an implicit friend of the white nationalist movement, um, you know, they, they saw their leader in him. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, there is the very much that came out in my interviews of them, just this kind of visceral uh, fear, which fear turns into anger, hatred. So there you uh, go. You and I could talk for days. I know that we could. And I actually want to get a hold of that book because I'm curious as to what their mindset was. Uh, as you know, I like to pick things apart and try to figure it out. Um, but our hourglasses ended, which stinks because you, I know, can you believe that? It goes by so fast. I, I, I thought we just started talking three minutes ago. 
<laughs> I know, but we actually have fun when we do talk together. Um, yes. Tell us where we can find more information about you so that some people can get some more of your books because you are a fascinating person and you do some really great work. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate you having me back on the show and hope we'll make it a, a threesome. A threesome. Wait a minute. Woo, don't tell you what. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, have a <laughs> I have a website, which is my full name, Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, Raisley, R-A-S-L-E-Y, uh, dot com. And I also have an author page on Amazon. So uh, you can Google my name and uh, you'll find my website if you don't remember my name. Uh, uh, or uh, go to Amazon and you'll find my books there. All right. Well, and I'll do you one solid and I'll put your links below so everybody can click on and say hi and, and get more information because I think um, out of many people that I've interviewed over the years, you're one of the most fascinating and, and you have you have a compassionate way of getting to provocative conversation without being primordial. <laughs> well, thanks. And yeah, I, I wish we had more time. I, I do hope we'll, uh, we'll connect again day. soon. I promise you, okay. you definitely got to come on to the podcast this fall. When I start that season, yeah. give lots of love to the baby Cameron, you're a lucky guy. Namaste rusty. Namaste, Jeff. See you soon. You're watching Living and Thriving with Rusty, and I'm Rusty, and this is what I love to do. I love to meet fascinating individuals who actually do a lot of good, maybe not in the trajectory of fundraisers and parades and things like that, but to give thought and perspective as to the way the world seems to be, or maybe it's not. Who knows? I personally think a lot of it's just an illusion that is fear-based and we need to get over that and start working together and being more of a community rather than uh, adverse with each other and dividing each other. Because at the end of the day, if I were to split everybody open, you all look the same on the inside. So it doesn't matter what you look on the outside, right? I don't think so. Know that you're loved. Know that you're beautiful. Make sure that you go out and do something kind for somebody today because you can change the trajectory of somebody's life. You can turn a frown upside down, as they say. Until next time.